Hi, everybody. Well, I would also love to teach that course, so hopefully at one point in Finland we can do so. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Stark, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Lightning, a blockchain startup. And today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the history of the internet, and then quite a bit about the future. In the early days of the internet, we had proprietary networks like AOL, CompuServe, Prodigy. In fact, in the year 1995, it was the year that I first got onto the internet, and I was on AOL, and I remember you could get 100 free hours, and there were CD-ROMs. How many people here were on one of these networks? Okay, a good amount. 1995 was also the year that Time Magazine uh, declared a welcome to cyberspace. Because in fact, despite these proprietary networks where they could control, for example, the network, it was the World Wide Web that ultimately won out. And part of why they won out was because it was open and decentralized. Anybody could run a server, anybody could create a website. The internet was a decentralized place where anyone could participate. And of course, anyone could make an animated GIF. It was also the year that the movie Hackers came out. How many people here have seen the movie Hackers? Johnny Lee Miller, Angelina Jolie, really good soundtrack. Um, I actually, with some friends in New York, organized a 20th anniversary party last year. Maybe some people here in Helsinki want to do one for the 25th. So then we had a change of direction, moving on in the OOs, the knots, if you will. There was the advent of what we call the cloud. And it was amazing because you didn't need to run your own server, you could just put your files on the cloud. And you also had the advent of the walled garden. So you had networks where they were controlled by one intermediary. It could be Facebook or Twitter. And they would decide, you know, you must use your real name, or this is what the algorithm is, or, you know, here are the rules for our API. And there were substantial advantages. It, you know, the user experience was much better. It wasn't really hard to set it up. But there were lots of disadvantages as well. And actually, in the end, it turns out we figured out what the cloud was. It wasn't actually a cloud, it was really just someone else's computer. So also around that time, we had what we call the peer-to-peer -peer wars. And we saw the advent of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, decentralized technology, like BitTorrent. But actually, it turns out, you know, BitTorrent as a network enabled people to uh, download pieces of files from a decentralized network of other people on the network. But there was a lot of politiz politicization of this technology because it turned out it made it really easy to violate copyright. And this is Bram Cohen, he's uh, the creator of BitTorrent. He told me a few months back that actually he didn't realize BitTorrent would be used for video because he thought that it was going to be too difficult to download video. But actually it turns out he was wrong. He'll, he's actually involved now in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency world. So along comes the year 2008. And something really important for the global financial industry happened. And it turns out, an anonymous individual by, who go, went by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto released a paper on the internet in 2008 called Bitcoin. Also, there was a whole financial crisis. You guys might have heard about it. But, so Bitcoin is at its core, open source, peer-to-peer -peer money, and it was a new form of decentralized technology, kind of following in the footsteps of the previous attempts for decentralization. And what this technology did at its core was it solved what we call the double spending problem. How do you have a network of servers and computers um, that enable somebody to not spend the same money twice? Well, traditionally in the financial system, there would be one central bank or one bank that would ensure that if you spent one euro, you would not spend it again. But it turns out if you want a currency for the internet, that's actually quite a bit harder because somebody can try to spend the money twice. But actually Bitcoin solved this problem. And how did it do so? Well, the underlying protocol of Bitcoin is called the blockchain. Some of you may have heard of it. And the way the blockchain is structured is that in each block, there's a record of all the transactions that occurred on the network. And actually, each block is then mined by a network of servers who verify the transactions on the block. And then all the other servers and the computers and the nodes on the network receive the information that that is the correct block. And each block builds on top of the previous block. And actually, if there are two blocks that are mined, and this is fairly rare, the longest block wins. So you know what the consensus on the network is, and you're able to know that your money has not been double spent. So underlying Bitcoin as well, sometimes people call Bitcoin as a protocol, other times they call it as a currency or the token. 
And Bitcoin, the token, is the currency you know, that people have invested in. The current price is about 735 US dollars. Um, there are currently 16 million Bitcoins in existence, and the market cap is about 12 billion US dollars. Only 21 million Bitcoin will ever be created. But the really genius thing behind Satoshi's invention was that every time somebody mined a block on the network, they received Bitcoin. So actually there was an incentive for people to do so. Because it's actually rather expensive. It takes quite a bit of electricity and processing power to mine, but people get paid. So they get paid and then they continue to run and operate the network. And it turned out this was a lesson in economic incentives and game theory, and it worked. So you may have heard a lot of talk about the blockchain and some people say, oh, I don't like Bitcoin, but hey, the blockchain is cool. But I'm a big believer that actually both are very significant. And in fact, the power of public decentralized blockchains can provide a new protocol for the internet and for transactions. So for example, this can enable peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. There's one in our community called Open Bazaar, where anybody can post something to sell. For example, you can buy soap or I think like physical Bitcoins if you want. And um, anybody can then send using Bitcoin and there's no one entity like an eBay that runs it. And it works, check out Open Bazaar today. Identity, so this is a huge issue. For example, many people have had their personal data breached or stolen. I myself have had several instances where my data has been stolen. I keep getting like calls from people trying to steal my info. And because the data is stored in a centralized means, for example, on a server, like with me, my health insurance company stored my data and then it was breached, um, this makes it really easy to hack. But we can have a much more decentralized infrastructure where users can store data on their personal device. And something like the blockchain can enable authentication without one honeypot of personal data that hackers can then go steal. The blockchain can also enable verification and authenticity. So at its core, the blockchain is an immutable ledger where you know that everything on it is authentic and cannot be modified. So for example, if I have a document that I want to ensure hasn't been changed or health records or property records, there are so many applications that the blockchain can enable. One application that I'm particularly excited about is the advent of a, digital, a native digital currency for the internet. So for example, the original creators of the internet uh, envisioned that there would be some kind of e-cash for the internet. And when they created the error codes for the internet, for example, 404, do people here know 404 error? Um, they actually created a 402 error as well. Payment required. But it turns out there was no means for you know, somebody to actually pay on the internet back then. But now we finally have the means to enable internet native payments or micropayments. And for example, you know, the question is, well, why not just use a credit card? Well, it turns out that when you use a credit card, your public key is your private key. What does this mean? It means that if somebody has access to your credit card and the information on it, or they just get that data somewhere, for example, some hackers on the internet have a database of credit cards, they can then use that same number to pay and you know, have fraudulent transactions. And I'm sure many of us have had this happen to us. But with Bitcoin and digital currency, you have it separated between a public key and a private key, such that if you know my public key, which is effectively my address, kind of like an email address that you can send to, that doesn't mean you can also steal my money. So as a result, in the credit card industry, it costs about a minimum of 30 or so cents to send a transaction because of the underwriting risk of this potential fraud. But actually, it turns out with digital currency, you don't have this risk. So you can send really small amounts, which is very exciting. So this is a Doge. How many people here know Dogecoin or the Doge meme? Yeah? It's a really cute fluffy dog from Japan, I think. Um, and there was a currency called Dogecoin that came out, and it was very meme-based, that enabled these small value payments. You could send 10 Dogecoin, and it would have been like, you know, less than a cent or something. And it actually was a whole community online of people exchanging this currency. So last year in 2015, two of my colleagues released a paper on what is called the Lightning Network, and this is what we're working on with our company. And it turns out there is a major problem in Bitcoin and other blockchains, and that is one of scalability. So remember how I talked about this idea of the public ledger? Well, actually, it turns out all the nodes and the miners on the network need to know every single transaction that ever occurred on the network. And currently, the Bitcoin blockchain, which is a list of all these transactions that have ever occurred, is about 90 gigabytes, so it's quite large. But actually, you know, it's fairly hard to scale that because it turns out that it can be quite difficult. It's kind of like 
if you send an email, and then in order to send an email, you needed to know every previous email that had ever been sent, right? So what Lightning does is it pro proposes a solution to this. Right now, um, it takes 10 minutes approximately to send a transaction on Bitcoin. Uh, that is the block time. So each time a block is mined, it's about 10 minutes. What Lightning enables is instant transactions. On Bitcoin, you can transact about five to 10 uh, transactions per second, in part due to the need to have all the transactions on the ledger. Lightning can enable hundreds of thousands, hopefully one day millions of transactions per second. And then on Bitcoin, you have pretty low fees. It's about five to 10 cents, so lower than a credit card. But Lightning can enable fees of a hundredth of a cent or even lower, potentially. And okay, this sounds amazing, and how does it do this? Well, the way that Lightning works, it's what we call a layer two protocol on top of Bitcoin and the blockchain, or other blockchains as well. And so you're able to send transactions between two parties. For example, you have Alice and Bob, and by the way, in crypto, we love Alice and Bob, they're everywhere. Um, and they both put some funds into what we call a two out of two multi-signature transaction on the blockchain. And what that means is they both enter funds into this transaction that both parties have to sign in order to complete. And then once they do this, and this takes 10 minutes to get onto the network, they can transact between each other instantly and on the network trustlessly. So that's pretty cool. But actually, how many times do you just pay one person? Maybe your bank or your local shop, but that's not so useful. So actually, what Lightning enables is much like the way that packets travel through various servers on the internet, you can have payments and transactions as packets. So here we have Alice who wants to get to Aaron. And actually, you can chain these transactions. So you can go through all the others here in order to get to the end. And the really cool thing about this technology is the intermediary nodes here actually cannot steal the money, which is huge. And this is taking away the trust that we've traditionally had in financial systems. Cryptographically, the intermediary nodes uh, can only receive funds if and only if they've already forwarded it. So they cannot seize the funds. So what you have here is you no longer need the types of trust in intermediaries in the financial institutions or even in the Ubers or Airbnbs and marketplaces that you previously had. So I talked a little bit about Lightning on Bitcoin. It can work on other blockchains. There are quite a lot that are out there. But one really cool thing is Lightning can also work between blockchains. So here we have Alice and Carol who want to exchange two assets. And you know, Alice is on a bank chain. The bank has issued their own blockchain. And Carol has an equity, some kind of stock. And there's a node, let's call him Bob, between that has liquidity on both sides, so possesses both assets. And through Lightning, you can swap these assets and exchange them in a decentralized way without having to trust Bob. Now, the underlying blockchains here need to be secure. If the blockchain itself can be attacked, that's an issue. But ostensibly, any bank or equity chain should be well secured. So what Lightning can enable is the ability to have decentralized asset exchanges where you no longer need, say, broker-dealers or financial intermediaries in order to do so. And the security of the network, as I mentioned, is ultimately within the blockchain itself. So what this means is if somebody tries to, for example, um, broadcast a transaction, this is the way it works, um, to the blockchain saying that they have a different amount of funds than they actually do, the blockchain will secure it. And the blockchain effectively knows cryptographically how much money each party has. It's a dispute resolution mechanism where it always knows what the end result will be because this system, which is a smart contracting system, will tell the blockchain what's happening. So ultimately, the blockchain can function as a global decentralized ledger where it's a judge that can't be bribed. You know, you can't even make an argument to it because it's already predetermined what's going to happen here. And this type of technology can be used, for example, in the IoT space, so for machine-to-machine -machine transactions for automated execution. And for smart payments, for example, what if I want to browse the internet and either watch a 30-second ad or pay five cents, and I can set that in an automated payment policy? Well, then I can just pay five cents, and I can skip the ad. So Lightning in and of itself is a smart contract platform, but there are all sorts of really interesting smart contracting technologies that are out there. For example, um, there's a blockchain. How many people here have heard of Ethereum? So this is a, a blockchain that's kind of a descendant, if you will, of Bitcoin that enables smart contracts. And they have what we call a Turing complete language within Ethereum where you can write any kind of computation within it. And that can enable automated execution 
Um, you have something called Rootstock, which is built in a side chain, so a side blockchain to Bitcoin, um, that uses Bitcoin and does similar smart contracting language. So there are all sorts of really interesting possibilities for financial transactions, for economic transactions, for marketplaces, where then you can automate transacting on the basis of a given condition. So ultimately, what all this technology enables is a new kind of decentralized protocol, an open transaction infrastructure that anyone can build upon. And the trust is no longer the margin. In the past, when you had central intermediaries, their job was to be the trusted entity, and it turns out they could accumulate a lot of value and wealth in doing so. Well, things are changing, and now we have the potential to have a, a decentralized protocol and infrastructure that can change all of this. So there's some people that really like blockchains. They want, put, they want to put everything in a blockchain. This guy wants to put his uh, dog on the blockchain. Don't recommend that. But actually, there's a huge amount of potential with this technology. And we're effectively in 1995 all over again. It's the early days of Bitcoin, blockchains, and this kind of decentralized infrastructure. But we have a new chance to create a new type of internet where you don't have to trust central intermediaries, and you can have anybody can build anything on top of this infrastructure. Check out Lightning.network, and thank you so much for having me.